to day two of Silicon Flatirons Conference on Frontiers and Spectrum Sharing. Um, glad to have everybody back again. And I think we've got another great day of discussions as we continue to explore spectrum share. So today we'll be discussing governance and incentives and then close off with a wrap up. Okay, I'm, get, I'm told I'm, I'm not coming through on the, okay. Uh, so we'll be discussing governance and incentives and then close off with a discussion of the key takeaways and next steps and, and to go. So a couple of reminders again to moderators and panelists. Uh, so again, we follow the, the Phil Weiser rule that students get to ask the first questions. Um, I guess I wasn't audible yesterday, but Phil Weiser was the founder of Silicon Flatirons and is currently the Colorado Attorney General. Again, a reminder to uh, remember the no acronym rule. Uh, we're not all from the same community, so define your acronyms on first use. And with that, I'm gonna introduce Dale Hatfield. I think most everybody here knows Dale or knows about him. He's currently a distinguished advisor at Silicon Flatirons and co-director of the Spectrum Initiative, now with me. Um, Dale has over 50 years of experience in telecommunications and spectrum management. So over to you, Dale, to introduce our keynote speaker. Uh, thank you, uh, Keith. Welcome. Good morning. It's my honor and privilege to introduce this morning's keynote speaker, FCC Commissioner Nathan Summington. President Donald J. Trump nominated him to serve as a commissioner of the FCC, and he was confirmed in that position by the Senate in 2020. Commissioner Symington brought both private and public sector experience to the commission. Previously, he served as a senior advisor at the National Telecommunications and Information Administration, NTIA. In that role, he worked on many aspects of communications policy, including spectrum allocation and planning, broadband access, and the US government's role in the internet. Prior to joining the commission, he was a senior counsel at Brightstar Corporation, an international mobile devices services company. In that capacity, he led and negotiated telecommunications equipment device services in over uh, 20 uh, transactions in over 20 uh, countries. Prior to joining Brightstar, he worked as an attorney in private uh, practice. Now, on a more personal level, for the past several months, I have had the opportunity to brief Commissioner Simon and his staff on technical aspects of spectrum management. In doing so, I found Commissioner Simon to be particularly adept at asking, uh, particularly adept at asking very in-depth questions very penetrating questions about the technical facts and then figuring out profound inferences from those facts and other information that he and the commission staff had assembled. Finally, as someone who has worked, been involved in spectrum management issues at the national level, uh, something over uh, 50 years now, and under both political parties, I have also been especially impressed by his willingness to reach across the aisle in search of technical and other solutions to our nation's most pressing spectrum sharing issues. Please join me in welcoming Commissioner Symington to the virtual podium. Good morning. Dale, I greatly appreciate your kind introduction. I'm delighted to have the chance to speak to you all today about spectrum sharing, an issue that will surely define the future of, of spectrum policy. People often say that spectrum is congested. In my view, this is a good problem to have. It means that spectrum is desirable and heavily used. As such, we have a spectrum congestion problem that we didn't have when we were less developed and lacked the ability to exploit spectrum as thoroughly as we do today. Within living memory, Silicon Valley was farmland and spectrum likewise was so abundant that the easiest way to connect spectrum to services was just to give every service its own bound. And 
Just as we needed new planning and land use regimes as cities grew and became more sophisticated, the question of how to handle new demands on spectrum suggests new spectrum use regimes. Spectrum congestion for 5G midband is often in the news, but as an important an issue as this undeniably is, it is just one example of the new demands on spectrum. I'm going to discuss a few specific bands and challenges today, but I'm also going to mention general concepts of sharing in some current and proposed regimes, technologies relevant to sharing, and factors tending to cut against sharing. And I hope you'll indulge me if I return now and then to land sharing as an extended metaphor, because spectrum is like land, they just aren't making any more of it. There's a recent report, Taking Stock of Spectrum Sharing, by John Leibovitz and Ruth Milkman, that I would encourage everyone to read. I don't think it's possible to provide a more lucid and thoughtful account of the theory and practice of spectrum sharing, so I'm not even going to try. Instead, I'm going to adopt much of its vocabulary and framing today. Leibovitz and Milkman make the familiar point that use of spectrum is restricted in frequency, space, and time, and maybe the more subtle point that it's also as a, uh, through signal, through the use of protocols and techniques permitting massively scaled coexistence in a single band and service. So under the existing framework, the table of frequency allocations, or TFA, is a sharing system by frequency under which licenses distinguish on space and time. The TFA is static at any given time and only dynamic in that it can be gradually revised. They also furnish a helpful definition of a sharing policy and as one permitting multiple overlapping types of spectrum use in a single band and geography. And that makes the point that after all, all spectrum is in some sense shared, um, but we uh, want to have a more specific definition of spectrum policy to oppose uh, the existing ex exclusive use regime. Automatic sharing regimes promise to go farther than the TFA in fulfillment of this definition. Any static system is going to exclude almost all uses, and whenever it's not in use, the spectrum is fallow. Or if it's used um, to transmit only a limited amount of information, likewise, we ask the question of whether it's being adequately exploited. An automatic sharing regime proposes almost the opposite, to enable diverse uses by permitting time and frequencies to be used by multiple services in a coordinated fashion. Leibovitz and Milton categorize such regimes with two sets of parameters. A regime can be first coordinated informing or sensing, and then second decentralized or decentralized. In a coordinated regime, multiple radio systems plan their coexistence in advance. In an informing regime, one service tells another to be quiet so it can talk. In a sensing regime, services detect when one another is talking and hold back. Likewise, in a centralized regime, there are one or more central agents running the regime, whereas in a, in a decentralized one, the users themselves coordinate. So coordinating, informing, and sensing regimes all have their places, whether centralized or decentralized. This diversity of conceptual tools is not then about finding a single ideal approach. Like frequency allocations, regimes should be tailored to anticipated uses, the priorities of users, the physical characteristics of the frequencies at issue, and a mix of incumbent and new user perspectives. Mixing in new uses is a particularly compelling aspect of the sharing model. If the TFA has to be revised every time a new service is conceived, new services face a steeper barrier to entry, both in costs and in time, than under a sharing regime permitting a variety of conforming users at a variety of priorities. Perhaps in the future, increasingly flexible radios and pervasively shared spectrum will allow a given device or network to select optimal and continually varying frequencies from moment to moment, much like an automobile navigation system offering alternate routes based on tolls, congestion, and unforeseen circumstances. However, there are no free lunches, even in spectrum sharing. A static allocation regime solves coordination problems from, from its inception at the price of rigidity. A dynamic sharing regime addresses them on the fly at the cost of operating overhead and limiting the functionality of each shared service. The proper weighting between these two factors is an empirical question, and our choices between these strategies, particular bounds, are path dependent in two senses. First, we get to our present allocations by a particular intensely contested history. And if you look at our docket at the FCC, you'll see just how intensely contested, and that's just the tip of the iceberg. And unfathomable amounts of capital have been deployed to build systems arising from that history. And then second, while RF radiation may propagate in a vacuum, spectrum policy does not. And our policy options are constrained by government and business realities that may or may not easily integrate with notionally ideal policy in the abstract. There's a lot of talk about deploying artificial intelligence, or AI, and machine learning, or ML, to improve systems. And today, with Alpha Zero able to learn chess from scratch to the transhuman level in just a few days of playing against itself, 
I'd be cautious betting against lear learning machines, but the rules of Western chess have been fixed for hundreds of years and they're a limited domain. The rules of spectrum are a little harder to define. Live spectrum sharing decisioning via AI ML would require a model based on and searching for optimization of spectral efficiency. If that's what a spectrum sharing model is after, efficiency is narrowly defined, then machine learning may indeed prove to be part of a solution. But I'm going to throw a bit of cold water. Anyone familiar with machine learning will tell you that you need a data ocean to train and test a model. And it isn't clear to me where that data will come from. What historical spectrum sharing decisioning will the model train on? But beyond that, there's also a question of, shared, uh, of agreed parameters. Both data scientists and domain experts would have to collaborate to determine what efficiency is and should look like. That's a lot easier when such decisioning is done within an organization or within an industry where there's broad agreement about the subject. And I would, uh, I would venture to say that this doesn't uh, accurately characterize the spectrum sector, which is with its bristling complexity, frequent disagreements, and widely disparate priorities between different stakeholders. I don't think it's too much to say that good faith disagreements are incredibly common in the spectrum policy world. And therefore disagreements would also apply as to the criteria design and implementation of AI or ML as a method for spot frequency allocation. So while this is clearly part of the future, I think we should be a little cautious about, um, about the, the speed with which it can be implemented and not look to it as an immediately deployable solution. What's more, we have data on the current evaluation of shared versus exclusive use in two very similar bands in the three gigahertz range. Industry proved willing to pay far more uh, per megahertz pop for full power exclusive use licenses in C-band than for lower powered shared licenses in CBRS. This isn't necessarily an argument against CBRS because C-band was uniquely well suited to wholesale clearance. Still, it should give us pause for at least one category, 5G midband in the 2.5 to 6 gigahertz range, industry values full power exclusive use licenses far more than it does flexible shared access. Or to put it another way, in some industrial zones, industry appears to be much happier um, with exclusive use zoning for shipyards and nuclear power plants without putting apartment buildings in the middle of them. American spectrum regulators have faced criticism for not making more of this vital midband spectrum available. And this very lack of flexibility in an environment full of incumbents is precisely what proponents of sharing can point to when warning about the future. What if we're setting ourselves up to be short of something else down the road by excessive rigidity in the present? And that's why I think the real answer is a synthesis. We have to think about the future, even the distant future, and not exclude ourselves from it by making decisions today that prevent us from getting there. But while our eyes are trained on the future, we also have to identify how to succeed today in one year, in five years. And the knowledge of how to do so is highly specific and granular and cannot be abstracted away. Um, to coin a phrase, we may make our fate, but we do not make it how we wish. There's immediate pressure for successful deployments and for immediately deployable products among vendors, manufacturers, and designers. As a regulator, you have to weigh the, um, the immediate intentions here on one hand with the past to the future on the other. And you have to ask both how we get there now and how it helps us to get where we think we're going collectively. Um, one current market pressure is the pressure to deploy systems that can be run with relatively light oversight in overseas deployments. It's worth remembering that um, as much as, you now I say this with all love as a naturalized citizen, as much as Americans sometimes like to beat up on themselves, we are, we are still a country with a very, very deep scientific and technical bench. And there are many countries that could benefit from continuing to upgrade their telecom infrastructure in a way that is relatively light touch and does not require uh, sitting at the bleeding edge of technology. After all, the purpose of communications technology is to facilitate production, increase public safety, improve people's lives, not to aspire to an ideal uh, that does not connect uh, actionably in the present to those goals. Implementation matters and immediate upside drives decisioning. What's more, I, I'd also like to point out that there are a variety of challenges ongoing at any given time in the spectrum world, and we shouldn't let focus on getting to a goal of pervasive sharing get too much in the way of addressing immediate challenges for which there's limited regulatory and industrial attention. So some of these challenges that, uh, that I'm working on, that my team is working on, and that I care about um, as fundamental, include addressing spectral densification um, largely within the current receiver model, that is, without the assumption that receivers and transceivers will be able to arbitrarily choose spectrum, 
and uh, and thus looking at immediate challenges to reception. Um, for example, I remain concerned about spurious emissions and intermodulation interference as services become more densely packed. Um, I'm interested in looking at the, the possibility of reducing guard bands where possible. Each megahertz of guard band just becomes more valuable by the year, so we face more and more questions on how to bring those vacant lots into use to the extent it's possible. Uh, there's, there are also questions of signal security that are, I think, of significant importance. I want to go ahead and say to any network operators who may be listening that this is not a challenge to network security, but is instead about the, uh, the security of edge devices attached to that network um, and may not, thus not impact the network at all. So with limited ab ability for regulators to focus, we sort of have to pick our battles. And it's therefore my view that, that spectrum sharing is going to continue to be an exciting possibility into the future, but we can't depend on it to replace the existing model. And there will continue to be deep interest in full power exclusive use as a model for, now well, I'm sure for the remainder of my term, which is, uh, which is probably the scope of my horizon at this point. Um, thank you very much for your attention today. It's been an honor and a privilege to address you, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, as I said earlier, per the Phil Weiser rule, uh, we'll start off the questions with a uh, student question. Jason, Jonathan Stokely is here to ask you your first question. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, it was very interesting to hear you talk about spectrum sharing. Um, as somebody who knows enough about spectrum to be dangerous, it's uh, the concept of being able to regulate, as you say, when people need to use it and allow signals to bypass each other to reduce interference is very intriguing. Uh, as an entrepreneur, I'm curious of what opportunities you see um, on the horizon to help enable spectrum sharing so that we can help enable a more open future for the future. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, first of all, it's, it's always great to hear from people who are looking for practical applications in this space. So first of all, this, the spectrum sharing models that we look at um, in contemporary discourse very often con contain the, the concept of multiple competing administrators, um, sometimes even multiple types of administrators within a single sharing regime. Um, so I think there's a lot of room there for blocking and tackling. This, uh, this, this might not necessarily be um, the sort of thing that makes the front, the front page of Fast Company, but, it's, but this, I, this really will be an area, I think, where uh, significant businesses are built up. And you know, coming from the B2B business world, um, very often there's a, there's a lot of infrastructure under, this, uh, under the skin that doesn't have a lot of visibility to the general public, but the people who manage that uh, are doing important work and often have, uh, having very successful careers. So, uh, so as far as um, so as far as opportunities to, to operate in that space, that's one of them. Another one would be to continue looking into, and I'm, I'm sorry, I don't know your particular focus, but another to, one to look into would be uh, the continued development of SDRs. I'm sorry, software-defined radios. So, a software-defined radio is intrinsically more friendly to a spectrum regime than um, than a radio that's uh, operating on, on a more traditional model. Another question might be figuring out um, opportunistically which bands could be shared and getting in there when another, uh, when another entrepreneur has not yet identified that opportunity. There are some bands that just need to be quiet, but if you can find a way to coexist with the services on that band, um, even to offer them incentives to coexist with you, um, whether that might be, I don't know, paying to upgrade their equipment or something like that, if the result is that you get access to that band uh, ahead of someone else, then you've really stolen a march, and that may be an opportunity to gain a significant chunk of spectrum access without having to go through the, um, the, the full procedure of gaining exclusive use to that spectrum yourself, which just might not be forthcoming under any circumstances, given the other pressures in that band. So those are some off the top ideas, and I hope those prove, prove fruitful, but if you'd like to further discuss, um, I'd uh, be happy to talk further offline. Thank you, I uh, definitely enjoy that. Appreciate it, Commissioner. Okay, and we have a, a series of questions that popped up on the Q of A, the first of which was, uh, can you please speak to desirability or undesirability of receiver standards? 
Oh, um, you're you're really talking my you're you're really uh, talking my language here. Um, <laughs> receiver standards. Uh, receiver standards are um, are near and dear to my heart, and uh, I'd like to um, I'd like to thank Dale Hatfield for for uh, some very very fruitful discussion and instruction on this topic. Um, he and I have have been over many nuances of this, although of course all errors are mine because the thought that Dale would make an error in this area is inconceivable. Okay, so receiver standards. This has always been a fraught question at the FCC, and I think you know my reading of the tea leaves is that every time someone has considered the question of receiver standards. Everyone's been worried, or not everyone, but most people have been worried that the FCC is, finds it hard to have a sufficiently synoptic view of every possible circumstance to issue receiver standards that would be precedential and possibly have unanticipated knock-on effects on a wide variety of services. So it's always died on the point. That doesn't mean that receiver standards um, shouldn't exist or are not uh, de facto in, or in fact, are not even legally mandated. There are a number of federal services that do mandate receiver standards. So the question becomes, um, how can we get to a receiver standard proposal at the FCC that does not overly alarm industry and is sufficiently complex and granular as to not be uh, an offensive act of regulation to, uh, to do more good than harm with it? So. Um, the question is, I think, going to be evergreen and is now on the horizon pre precisely because of some of the issues that I raised at the tail end of my speech about the increased possibility of uh, near far problems, the increased possibility of um, desensitization, spurious emissions, intermodulation that occur as more and more powerful services are lit up in more and more congested bands. Um, what's more, sometimes it's the nature of this that the harms are difficult to anticipate in advance. So, for example, with that far out of band interference, the service that's causing the interference may be acting fully in accordance with its license um, and may have no ability to anticipate that that interference would exist because that interference would be in part an artifact of the de facto receiver standards in the service being interfered with. And those uh, might not even be available as technical specifications to the party causing the issue. So all this is to say that receiver standards are, I think, a problem that's not going to go away. Whether the right approach to resolving this is regulatory through getting all potential parties together in the room and whiteboarding together, or um, through some sort of uh, standard that's uh, issued at the level of a, a trade organization or standards body, that's an open question. And probably it, it admits of a variety of answers. But I think the receiver standards have got to be very much on the menu going forward, and they, we cannot afford to continue ignoring them forever. Thank you. Uh, next question we have is uh, thoughts on how to protect incumbents with wide deployments when new uses adversely affect their operation. Yes, that's a, that's a question. Is well, I'm going to go back to my I'm going to go back to my property rights extended metaphor. And so um, so not not to get to, not to get too law school, but we would say uh, we would say in, in some circumstances that if you have um, that if you have conflicting rights then so long as there's a clear regime of resolution, the parties can negotiate among themselves and each party can place the economic value that it sees each right to have uh, to be associated with on the table. And then we, we uh, would weigh that against the, um, the weight of legal right on each side and come to an economic resolution. Now, coming to an economic, uh, an economic resolution is, is much more complex in this space because the idea of a unitary stakeholder is, uh, you know, is, is usually pretty absurd. So as far as protecting incumbents, uh, one thing could simply mean, uh, one approach could simply be to require new entrants to pay incumbents off. And part of that, I mean, this, the, we could say that this is just part of the cost of entry. You're going to impose costs on these incumbents. Society thinks that these costs um, should be permitted if that's something that you would like to pursue, but you're not going to be given a free lunch at the expense of the incumbent. So, um, so, that, so that's one approach. Another would be to say to the incumbents that, um, and again, <coughs> highly situational, but would be to say to the incumbents, your incumbency is in some sense an unearned advantage or a windfall, and um, the, your recalcitrance in insisting on uh, on protection is simply a matter of you not wanting to pay uh, what uh, not not wanting to pay for your ride. So uh, so again, I would say that it's highly situational. But 
in, I, I think in most cases, things can be resolved just through, uh, through upgrades. Uh, there's, there's always, um, in, in cases where, where there's just no physical way to resolve the tension, then at that point, we really are choosing between which services there are. And if we're going to take the incumbents out, then we need a, a very, very thoroughly big transition plan. I I'm, I'm just assume that those situations are in the minority. When it's possible for the uses to, to be reconciled and uh, through when it's possible for the uses to be reconciled simply by equipment upgrades, which I'm going to point out is pervasive in the federal context. I mean, if you look at the amount of federal services that were upgraded in connection with AWS 3 and AWS 1, it's very extensive. So if, if it can be resolved by upgrades and we can find that money uh, from the new entrant as in uh, spectrum relocation fund monies, then um, I would say that that is a win for everyone. It's a win for society, it's a win for the new entrant, and it's a win for the incumbent. Where, uh, where things get more dicey is when you ask questions about the rightfulness of the incumbent or when uh, services simply can't be re reconciled. And if services can't be reconciled, then that's a very tough decision, and the FCC probably should not act precipitately in that case. No, thank you. Um, we have a couple of related questions that, that go into a little more detail. One of the ones that, that popped up in our chat window was, more sophisticated the sharing regime, the greater the possibility for disputes. Please elaborate how the FCC could facilitate dispute re resolution in spectrum sharing regimes. You kind of touched on that, but maybe add a little more detail. Yeah, absolutely. So um, dispute resolution and spectrum sharing regime, regimes is, is a tough question because, um, because in, in, a, in a sharing regime, if you're just expecting everyone to play nice, then it could be a very <coughs> based investigation. Um, on the other hand, if, you've, if you have explicit prioritization baked in, then the question becomes a little bit uh, more straightforward because it's simply a question of, of whether all parties are correctly acting in accordance with their priority. And the whole point of an automatic sharing regime is to automate that so that no party can act outside of its priority. And thus, uh, disputes of this sort should not uh, arise in the ordinary course. Um, but this, this is a pervasive problem when we have a bound that has, that has a multitude of uses because one, one user may uh, lead to a tragedy of the common situation. In that case, I think that means that the FCC may not have thought hard enough about what the sharing regime should really be like. And now I suspect that this question may be motivated um, and I'm not gonna, uh, not gonna attempt mind reading, but it at least makes me think of the current spectrum re sharing regime that's applicable to satellite. And I think the FCC we need to re-examine the whole question of what satellite spectrum sharing looks like in the future um, as more and more uh, services go up and more intense use is made of satellite bands. Um, but, I'm, but I think that's, that question is sufficiently complex. I'm not going to try to fully address it now. Uh, thank you. I think we have time for one more. And uh, next one on the docket was getting rid of guard base can cause interference and harm spectrum use for others that didn't design for that. How can that be implemented fairly? Again, that is a great question. And, um, and eliminating a guard band is something that should be done with a great deal of trepidation. So um, you, I, I, you folks are going to get sick of me in my real estate metaphors, but it, it strikes me <laughs> a little bit like demolition of a building that was built with asbestos. Um, it, there's, it, it's got to be done very cautiously because there's really the, the possibility that you'll pollute the environment. So, um, the, so, the, so the elimination of any guard band has got to thoroughly take into account the interests of all stakeholders and not, uh, not succumb to an optimism bias. We, we shouldn't let the potential value of that real estate blind us to the costs that we are going to impose by eliminating it. Um, any, so any question of guard band elimination is highly situational and, um, and uh, should secure broad comment and uh, I hope broad buy-in before any steps forward are taken. All right. Uh, thank you very much. I think we're out of time for questions now. So can we have a live and virtual round of applause and, and thanks for our <laughs> keynote speaker. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Uh, so now going on to uh, 